fell. Now, that's, that's one approach. The approach that I have used uh, is to model Mohamed Minsky's uh, theory of financial instability. And he was the one who asked that classic question that I think defines the post-Keynesian approach. Can a Great Depression happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it happen after World War II and before when he was writing here, which is 1982? And he said those are questions which flow naturally from the historical record of the last 35 years. He said to answer these questions, it is necessary to have an economic theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible stage states in which our type of capitalist economy can find itself. It was a brilliant piece of writing there. And he's describing his overall perspective. He said that there's one polar extreme view of capitalism that uh, serious depressions are man-made imperfections in the financial system, which is the neoclassical argument. The alternative view, which he was putting forward, he called unreconstructed Keynesianism, that capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises and depressions, and this instability is due to characteristics the financial system must have if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. Such a system will generate both signals that induce an accelerating desire to invest and it will also finance that accelerating investment. Now he blended Keynes and Minsky together, and actually his original inspiration was Fisher, not Keynes, to produce the financial instability hypothesis. And this argument is, starts by saying, take an economy in historical time. Now, if you're in historical time, there's a preceding crisis that you know about. So let's put ourselves at 1992, 93. There was the downturn in the 1990s uh, that led to the uh, successful election campaign for, uh, for uh, Clinton on the basis of it's the economy is stupid back in those days. And in that crisis, it was a debt-induced uh, crisis, the savings and loans crisis of the 1980s, the stock market bubble and burst and so on. So the economy is in a slump after that period. That means both firms and banks are conservative about the amount of debt that they'll allow uh, borrowers to take on. And this is not a case of asymmetric information, which is Joe Stiglitz's way of interpreting this. This is shared expectations about the future on both sides of the borrowing equation. What this means is only conservatively estimated projects get funded, given the current financial circumstances. But the, since the economy has recovered from the crisis, most of those projects succeed. And since they succeed, both firms and banks think, ah, oh, we were too conservative with the level of leverage. If we'd taken on more leverage, we would have made a greater profit. So the accepted ratio of debt to equity rises, a higher valuation is put upon assets, and you get this self-fulfilling expectations taking off where, because you're less of worried about a, cri a, a crisis, there's an increase in investment, and that causes the economy to grow faster, which validates some of these investments. Asset prices start to rise, so it's possible to speculate and make a profit on rising asset prices, and the money supply expands endogenously, as I've shown a moment ago. Riskier investments become enabled, some of which are losing money, of course. Asset speculation increases, and you get what Minsky calls the Ponzi financiers turning up. Curiously, I used to talk about Charles Ponzi, well, 20-something years ago. If I asked a room full of people, had they heard of Charles Ponzi before 2007, only a handful of hands would go up. Now if I ask who hasn't heard of Ponzi, only a handful of hands go up. It's become much more common to think about Ponzi financiers after this last crisis. Now Ponzi financier is someone who's losing money on their investments. They've borrowed more money. The servicing cost from the money they've borrowed is greater than the cash flow from the businesses they own. So how do they make a profit? They sell assets on a rising market. That gives them a desperate demand for debt throughout the whole period because they're repaying their interest bill with borrowing from other, other lenders. Uh, so they are insensitive to the level of interest rates because they simply have to have the money or they go bankrupt. Now the initial profitability of asset speculation drives up the supply of money and the d demand for it may cause market interest rates to rise, but ultimately you have a whole combination of factors that bring this bubble to an end. First of all, the Ponzi's are necessarily losing money. So if they have a problem in rolling over debt at any point, they go bankrupt, and of course that has a dramatic impact on the economy. Uh, a lot of the investments that are undertaken in this period are euphoric expectations-based expect investments, as Minsky puts it, where they are simply ludicrous ideas about how to make money. They're going to fail. Rising rates can make a lot of conservatively well-funded, well-estimated projects effectively speculative because of the higher cost of money and those non-Ponzi investors can enter the asset market to try to sell the assets to service their debts 
and the asset market is nowhere near as broad as people think it is. When the boom is going on, the market gets flooded and the rising trend of asset prices ends. And in that situation, the very first ones to go are going to be the Ponzi's. Pardon me repeating myself a bit here. I'll look that slide out uh, next time I get uh, do this presentation. So the Ponzi's go bankrupt because they can't sell assets for a profit and they can't roll over their debts anymore. Nobody will lend to them. Uh, whereas previously everybody wanted to lend and when the crisis hit nobody wants to lend to them. Asset prices collapse, the endogenous expansion of the money supply goes into reverse, investment evaporates, you're back where you started again in a debt induced recession. So we're talking the sequence we've been through from 1992 right through to 2007. Now in that situation if you happen to have high inflation and this was the case back in the 1970s and 80s then the debts could be repaid by the rising price level. And what that means is the economy would grow, but slowly because there's a very little investment going on, but there's high inflation. That's a, a Keynesian explanation for stagflation, this thing that Milton Friedman argued Keynesian theory didn't have. And of course, once you get through that period, then the cycle will start again when debt levels are reduced slightly by inflation rather than paying, paying debt down. If you have low inflation, then you can't repay the debts. You get a chain reaction of bankruptcies and the economy remains suppressed, you go into a depression. Now, if you have big government, and the government of the 1920s and 30s was small government compared to what you're used to today, then the anti-cyclical government spending can enable those debts to be repaid, and again, you'll get a cycle starting on the other side. Now, Minsky was ignored by the mainstream until that monster crash, and I've moved the animation for slightly further ahead, but the explanation that Fisher and Minsky focused upon was this role of private debt. 